Our scripture text this morning is found in James 5, beginning with verse 15. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gained rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Last summer, I found a book called The Gospel According to Dr. Seuss, and I gave you sermons from it. This year, I have a book given to me by a friend. If God is in control, why is my life such a mess? Now, we have varying types of messes in our lives, but we've all gone through periods or are going through or will go through periods where we wonder why our life is such a mess. This book was written by Michael Yosef, and for the next few weeks, that's what I will be sharing with you. I will tell his story because it's interwoven in the book and is very important to the message that he has to share with us. So today, is God really in control? Michael entered the Ministry of War Department with the words of his friends ringing in his ears. They'll never give you an exit visa, one of them had told him. You could end up in the army before you leave the building. Or in jail, another friend added. The man sitting behind the desk looked at Michael skeptically, but he provided him with the name of a particular general to see. But. You may not see him, he said, and even if you did, you would not get your visa approved. Why don't you let me go in and find out for myself? You're a university student, aren't you, he asked. No visas for university students. Day after day, Michael returned, only to be turned away. After several weeks of being refused, he spent an entire night in prayer. Very early the next morning, on a Sunday, he showed up at the minister's office. One of the guards saw him approach the secretary. The guard listened to the interchange for a while and then walked over to the desk. What's the trouble? the guard asked. The general will not grant visas to any university students. The secretary nodded at Michael and glared. Not for any reason. Michael said, but I have this invitation, and showed him his letter from a friend, of Leb friend in Lebanon. He continued, it's a request for me to visit Beirut for one week. Surely the general can allow this. No one gets out, the secretary argued. It's a government regulation. Who does the general think he is? God, the guard said. And he turned to Michael and smiled, pointing to the door. You go in there and you see the general. He stared at the secretary, defying him to object. Michael thanked the guard and hurried past the desk. Even before he reached the door, he could hear the general's voice. He was on the telephone and was using some of the foulest language he had ever heard. Michael knocked anyway, and without waiting for an answer, he walked inside. A man wearing the uniform of an army general stood behind a massive desk in the huge office. The atmosphere was intimidating. He guessed the general's part of the top brass at Gamal Abdel Nasser, head of Egypt's military 
regime had handpicked for this bureaucracy in order to discipline military personnel. Egypt's troops had been decimated by Israel during the Six-Day War one year earlier. Many soldiers had left the army and morale had remained low. The general continued cursing into the telephone until he noticed Michael. He quickly ended the call and turned to glare at him. What do you want, he growled. Michael stared at him, praying for courage. Well, what in the expletive do you want? Michael stepped forward and showed him his visa application. The general grabbed it out of his hand and dropped it on the corner of the desk. Don't you think I know why you're here? You're trying to escape national service. I know your kind. He ranted for several minutes. Then he glared at the application and picked it up. Michael, your name's Michael? He spit the words out furiously, knowing that in a predominantly Muslim country, only a Christian would have that name. You dare to come in here when you're from the worst segment of society? You Christians are nothing but scheming traitors. Michael could not utter a word. Fear began crawling through his body, and his body shook like a leaf clinging to a tree on a windy autumn day, or in our case, the wind is coming during the summer. While the general yelled, he prayed silently, Lord, this is not the answer to prayer I was expecting. You sent me here, so please do something. God did intervene, of course, and he was eventually granted an exit visa to leave Egypt, the country of his birth. Like the prophet Jeremiah, Michael was called to preach while he was in his mother's womb. His mother already had six children and was in very poor health when she became pregnant with him. Because of her medical condition, the doctor recommended an abortion and she had scheduled the procedure. Just before she entered the hospital, however, their pastor made an unusual late night visit to their house. His parents immediately knew that the purpose of this visit was quite serious because of the hour. Noza, he said to Michael's mother, I have a word for you from the Lord. Then let us hear it, his father said. You are not to terminate this pregnancy. I am well aware of your health problems, and I would never come to you with such advice if I did not believe with complete certainty that God had sent me. The pastor shared with his parents how he had been unable to sleep for several nights and how he had sought God about their situation. They listened patiently, not quite understanding, but wanting to be obedient to God. God is involved in this pregnancy, the pastor said. Do not be afraid. You will have the strength and the health to raise this child because this child will be born to serve the Lord. Michael's parents understood this message to mean that their yet unborn child, their seventh, would grow up to be a minister of God. No one in their families had ever been a minister, and the news came as a surprise. Devout Christians, they accepted the pastor's message as God's word, and they obeyed. Though it was a very dramatic episode in his family's life, Michael's prenatal calling is actually not as momentous as it may sound. You see, God knows each one of you intimately, and he has a plan for our lives, a plan that he puts into effect before we are born. The psalmist describes God's providence over our lives in this way. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 16. 
Before you were even born, God determined your lifespan, all the days ordained for you. That's a very comforting thought if you understand the sovereignty of God. None of us know whether we will be here tomorrow, but God does. So why should we worry about tomorrow? He already knows what, if anything, tomorrow holds for us. God not only knows the number of our days, he knows the number of hairs on our head. When the Bible says that the hairs of our head are numbered, it does not mean that God simply counted how many hairs are on our head. He has numbered each individual hair, meaning he knows exactly which ones are in your hairbrush or on the floor. God has chronological records of the strands of your hair. That's how important you are to him. Not even a sparrow falls to the earth without God knowing it. He is the creator of every living thing, and he watches over all of his creation down to the very tiniest of details. Yet, when tragedy occurs or when wickedness seems to triumph, many people ask, where is God? Why did he let this happen? When struggling to stay afloat on a sea of difficult circumstances, even the seasoned believer is tempted to ask, if God is in control, why is my life such a mess? Let me assure you, God is in absolute control of his creation. He governs the universe and everything that happens in it. But much of Christianity fails to recognize divine providence in daily events. We have lost the understanding of the sovereignty of God. We fail to see the big picture of God's sovereign plan for the universe. Another misunderstanding about the biblical concept of the sovereignty of God is a fatalistic attitude that says, if God is in complete control of events, that doesn't matter what I do. That is wrong. What you do matters a great deal. God created us with a capacity for free will. We have the ability to make choices. And those choices have consequences for good or for bad. As we will see, our free will has already been factored into God's overall plan. What the sovereignty of God really means is this. God is in control. He has a plan for our life, a plan for all of us. And we are part of his plan for the entire universe. From the moment of creation until now, God has been working out his plan, which the Apostle Paul explained in the first chapter of Ephesians. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will be reach their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head even Christ, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1, 9 through 11. One of the areas that we will explore is the importance of prayer. Even though God is in control and he is working everything out in conformity with his eternal plan, he still instructs us to pray. As contradictory as it sounds, our prayers play a vital role in changing the course of events in particular situations. And that underscores the need for us to pray in accordance with God's will. Too often we... Pray focused 
on trying to accomplish our plans and our purposes, not the divine purposes of God. Our goal in prayer should be to determine how we can fit into and further God's plan. When we pray in that manner, God will allow us a glimpse into his eternal perspective on events, a sneak preview of what lies just ahead of us. He never tells that far future. With that in mind, let me finish telling you the story of Michael's exodus from Egypt. I want to show you very briefly how God led Michael into his divine will, how he fulfilled his plan for Michael's life, and how he answered Michael's prayers. As a teenager, Michael had surrendered to God's call on his life. Along with that inner call came a strong conviction that God had called him into a preaching ministry, but not in Egypt. If not in Egypt, he had asked God, where? The United States came the answer. He did not hear the voice of God, and no further words came to him. But in his heart, he knew the answer. He was to leave Egypt. God would open the door at the right time. No matter how impossible it seemed at the moment, he had a deep assurance that he would receive his training for the ministry in another country and that he would eventually be a minister in the United States. He had no idea how God could possibly work this out. By 1968, life had become extremely difficult in Egypt, especially for Christians. Nationalism was on the rise, and contempt for the followers of Christ was growing. He detested the Nasser regime and its socialist ideals. As soon as he finished his university studies, he would have to enroll for military service, and the country was already preparing to fight Israel again. If he stayed in Egypt, he could not refuse to serve. But how would he be able to leave? Michael did what he had learned from his mother's example. He began to pray. Almost by the hour, the certainty grew that God was leading him to leave Egypt. For the next several weeks, he did not attend his classes. Instead, he used the time to make rounds of foreign embassies. His first choice, the American embassy, had closed after the Six-Day War. Canada, he learned, was no longer accepting immigrants. But when he visited the Australian embassy, he received good news. He filled out an application for immigration right on the spot. Subsequently, one of his brothers contacted an Australian friend who agreed to sponsor him. He had a physical exam and went through a series of interviews. At the end of six months, the embassy notified him that he had been accepted for immigration to Australia. All he had to do was get a passport and a prepaid airline ticket. He picked up his immigration papers and left the embassy rejoicing in God's answer to his prolonged prayers. The very same day, Nasser issued a new ruling. This is when the no university student ruling came. No university student could hold a passport. No university student could travel abroad. With his permission to immigrate to Australia, he should have been out of the country in a matter of days. Now, the ruling trapped him. Under the new rules, there would be no leaving Egypt. What do you suppose he asked God? If you answered why, you're exactly right. How could you allow this to happen, he asked. Why didn't you delay NASA's ruling by just a day or two? The situation did not make sense to him, but he had to trust that God was in control of the situation. As he continued to seek God, two sentences kept coming into his mind. Just pray, I will intervene. 
So he continued to pray. What other option did he have? After many weeks, Michael received a letter from a university friend who had returned to his home in Beirut. He had promised to send Michael an invitation to visit, knowing he would use the opportunity to try to leave Egypt permanently. If people in Egypt wanted to visit another Arab country for a week or less, they would be considered for an exit visa. If he could get an exit visa, he could then apply for a passport, something he would need if he ever hoped to immigrate to Australia or anywhere else, to get the visa required a visit to the Ministry of War Department. And that's how he wound up in the general's office, listening to that tirade against the Christians. I know how to fix you, the general yelled at Michael. I know what to do with Christians and other traitors. I will put you in a place where no one will ever find you again. You cannot run away from your duty to your country. Don't think I won't make an example. In the middle of that bombastic outburst, another general entered the office. He did not acknowledge Michael, but marched quickly to the desk, cutting off the general in mid-sentence. A problem had risen with a particular officer, and the two generals began to discuss this problem as if Michael wasn't even in the room. In their heated discussion, they seemed to have forgotten that Michael was there. To him, the sensible thing to do was to slip out of the office quietly while he had the chance. Having been threatened with jail and worse, he did not want to provoke the general any further. Cautiously, he took a step backwards, then another. About to turn around and walk all the way to door, he caught the visitor looking his way. What does this young man want, the visitor asked. An exit visa to visit Lebanon. Stupid boy. Oh, just let him go, the second general said. While the minister in charge protested, the visiting general reached for the visa application, which was still on the desk. Here, son, he took the application, signed and stamped it with the official ministry seal, and handed it back to Michael. Now go, get out of here. Michael could not leave fast enough. On his way out, he flashed his visa approval at the secretary and waved it at the guard who had led him into the general's office. But he did not slow down. Once outside, he crossed the street and sat down on a park bench. His body was still shaking. He was so queasy, he almost vomited. He stared at the paper in his hand. The signature and the stamp were there. God had done the impossible. I'd better pull myself together, he thought. He hurried to the passport office, where he submitted his exit visa and received clearance for a passport, which he would have to pay for and pick up the next day. When Michael returned the following day, the officer who issued his passport said, you must leave Egypt within 48 hours from the time your visa was issued, which was the day before. If you do not, the passport and exit visa are automatically revoked. How could he get ready to leave overnight? He had thought it would take weeks. Now he learned he had to fly out the next day or his chance to leave Egypt would evaporate, possibly forever. With his passport in hand, he went to the office of Egypt Airlines to book his ticket. The agent shook her head. I'm sorry, that is impossible. All flights are booked for the next six days. But I can't wait that long. He showed her his passport and exit visa. I have to leave by tomorrow. This is a religious holiday period, she said, referring to an Islamic holiday. She obviously did not intend to do anything to help a Christian leave the country. But I only need one seat. Yes, of course, but hundreds of others are ahead of you. They only wish one seat, and some of them have been waiting for weeks for a cancellation. 
Dejected, perplexed, he left the ticket office. Okay, God, he prayed silently as he walked. What do I do now? Immediately he thought of a Christian friend who worked for Egypt Airlines, so he headed for his office. He confirmed what the ticket agent had said. Michael, here is the best I can do for you. I will put your name on a waiting list. I'll move it as close to the top as I can. You go to the airport tomorrow by 4 a.m. This is the last flight that can get you out before the deadline. Beyond that, God will have to take over if he wants you to leave. That night, Michael agonized in prayer. Well before the first rays of morning light began to seep through the window, God had assured him everything was going to work out. If God wants me to leave Egypt, he told his family, he will get me on that plane. If not, then surely God is able to open a different door for me. At the airport, he watched the vast number of people milling around. As the plane began to load, he tried to count the travelers. It seemed to him that there were more people than can possibly fit into one plane. When the last ticketed passenger had checked in, the real wait began. A crowd still hovered around the airline counter. The hopeful were clutching their luggage, each one listening for the agent to start calling the standby names. A flight attendant came out, said something to the gate agent, shook her head, and went back to the plane. He continued, Michael, to pray silently. Finally, a voice called out the name of the first standby passenger who would make the flight, Michael Omahom Yosef. He was so overjoyed at hearing his name. As Michael thanked the gate agent, he said, you are one very lucky person. You know that? Lucky? You see those people? He pointed to at least 20 others waiting for permission to board this flight. We have only one seat available because of a cancellation. You were so lucky to be at the top of the waiting list. Michael took his seat on the plane, knowing he was not lucky at all. He was on that flight to Beirut because God was in control of the circumstances, not Nasser, not the Ministry of War Department, not Egypt Airlines. God was and is in control. We will be talking about the sovereignty of God in this series, primarily as it's demonstrated in the lives of the prophet Elijah and Queen Esther. But I wanted you to understand from the beginning that the principles from Scripture I will discuss are not just abstractions. They are very concrete, very real, and they have been proved in real life. You can test them and prove them as well. When most people think about Elijah, they consider him to be one of the super saints of the scripture. It is true that Elijah worked many miracles and had momentous encounters with God, but the Bible clearly states Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. Most people focus on these last part of these verses in James as a result of Elijah's prayer. They say, God does not answer prayer like this anymore, or I'm not one of God's super spiritual servants like Elijah, and that is why God does not answer my prayers. I will tell you one time, my very first church I had alone, people came in late and said, we've been on phones with our friends in Florida, and they're afraid the hurricane is coming toward their house. So we simply prayed that the hurricane would go around. It hit part of that town, but it didn't hit the section that they lived in. Now, I didn't do anything, 
but when given a need, we prayed, and God answered that prayer. I don't know how many other people were praying too, but God does answer prayer. Both of the conclusions that I mentioned earlier are wrong. The problem is that most people have never taken the time or the effort to understand how, why, and when God answered Elijah's prayer. Let's focus on the first part of that verse. Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was far from being super spiritual. We will see that he became depressed and discouraged. We will see that he felt scared and frightened. We will see that he doubted and was defeated. In other words, when James said that Elijah was just like us, it means that he was like us, very human and very vulnerable. As we go through the biblical account, we will actually discover more about God and how he works than we will about Elijah. We will see evidence in the way God works everything out in conformity with the purpose of his will. By studying his word, we will learn how God deals with his people, how he deals with individuals, how he deals even with nations. If you want to be effective for God, if you want God to use you, then you must discover how God works. I want to tell you now, though, that God is not impressed by what impresses people. God is not moved by what moves people. God does not judge people the way that we judge them. God has a different set of criteria by which he works with each of us. Each of us is different, and he uses each one of us in a different way. What is common to each of those who God uses, however, is a willingness to be melted down in service of the kingdom. A wonderful illustration of this principle comes from the life of Oliver Cromwell, who was Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland during the dark days of civil war in the mid-17th century. During Cromwell's administration, the treasury ran out of silver or mint coinage for the realm. Cromwell sent some of his men to travel throughout the kingdom and find silver for the treasury to use. The delegation reported back to Cromwell that the only silver they could find was in the statues of the saints in the cathedrals. What should we do, they asked their leader. Cromwell replied, we will melt the saints and put them into circulation. In such much the same manner, before God can use his man or his woman, before he can put his servants into circulation, he has to put them through a meltdown. I can tell you truthfully that many of God's saints have been sitting in the pews too long. God can not make you effective for his kingdom if you are satisfied to be a statue in a cathedral instead of a silver coin in circulation. God was able to use men like Elijah and women like Esther because they were willing to step forward, they were willing to get out of their comfort zones, willing to be melted down for the Savior's sake.